World Cup is one of the biggest stages in women's sports. 24 of the world's best teams have traveled to France for a shot at the trophy and the right to call themselves world champions. But only one team will take the top spot. America's leading ladies won it all in 2015 and are looking to defend their title. Winning back-to-back -back tournaments, however, is no easy feat, but American soccer legend Julie Foudy thinks the American team has what it takes. I think they look really good, yeah. I, um, I, I've been covering them for ESPN for years, post-retiring from my playing days, and, and as we know, they won the World Cup, of course, in 2015, the last World Cup, and it's super hard to go back-to-back -back in World Cups, and in fact, only one other country on the women's side has ever done it, and that's Germany. Uh, but I think this team has the potential to do that. But there's more than a trophy on the line for the Americans. Team USA is in the midst of a fight with its boss, the US Soccer Federation, over equal pay. It's a fight that has been going on for years, but the ladies of Team USA kicked up the pressure in March three months before the World Cup began. 28 players filed a discrimination lawsuit against the U.S. Soccer Federation in federal court, including the sport's biggest stars like Alex Morgan and Carly Lloyd. In it, the players claim U.S. Soccer has subjected the women's national team to continuing policies and practices of gender discrimination by paying them less than the members of the men's national team for substantially equal work. So how much money are we talking about? According to the filing, the most a member of the women's national team could make in a 20-game season was $99,000 between March 2013 and December 2016. That's a little under $5,000 per game. The men, on the other hand, would earn over $250,000 on average for that same season. That comes out to more than $13,000 per game. The difference in pay didn't happen by chance. Both the men's and women's teams have separate collective bargaining agreements, which are renegotiated every few years. During negotiations, U.S. soccer has consistently rejected the women's team's request for equal pay. The lawsuit claims in 2016 that the Federation argued market realities are such that the women do not deserve to be paid equally to the men. U.S. soccer has consistently pointed to lower ticket sales and ad revenue as reason for paying the women's team less. But America's finish in the 2015 Women's World Cup flipped the script. More than 23 million Americans watched Team USA beat Japan 5-2 in the championship game, making it the most watched soccer game in American TV history. That game marked a turning point for ticket revenues as well. Since winning, the women's national team has brought in more event revenue than the men's team. That's according to audited U.S. soccer financial reports obtained by the Wall Street Journal. In the three years following the World Cup, the women's team made almost $1 million more than the men's team. Despite all of their successes, the women's team made far less money than the men did in 2014. That year, U.S. soccer paid the men's national team more than $5 million in bonuses after losing in the round of 16. For their title-winning efforts, the women's national team received less than $2 million in bonus pay. It's important to note, however, that the World Cup bonus pool is determined by FIFA, not U.S. soccer. But in the end, these striking differences proved to be a breaking point for the women's team, says Hope Solo, who was the team's goalie at the time. After we won the 2015 World Cup, we as a team decided now is the time to change the future of sports moving forward. It is time to do whatever it takes, make self-sacrifices, make team sacrifices, and that might include losing, losing out on health insurance, um, not playing in as many games. There's a lot of sacrifices that would have to be made and we knew it was going to be a fight and we knew it would, would be a battle, but we said, you know what, we're ready. Less than a year later, Solo and four other teammates filed a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It was a major step for the women's national team in the fight for equal pay, but after two years, the players felt not enough had been done. So instead, they filed for the right to sue U.S. soccer, which was approved and paved the way for the current lawsuit. 
While the U.S. women's national soccer team is at the helm of the modern push for equality in professional sports, it's an issue that transcends soccer. From the LPGA to the WNBA, women don't receive the same pay or respect as their male counterparts, says basketball legend Sue Bird. It's tough because um, I think a lot of people do talk negatively, talk trash, tell us to make sandwiches, that kind of stuff, and I guarantee you those people haven't even seen a game. For decades, women have been paid less than men despite competing on the same stages while playing the same games, and little was done about it. That was until tennis star Billie Jean King served up an argument that the sport's biggest tournament couldn't refute. In 1972, King was on top of the women's tennis world. But when she won the U.S. Open that year, she made $15,000 less than the men's champion Ilya Nastase. That didn't sit well with King. The next year, King threatened to boycott the tournament unless both the men's and women's champions were paid equally. Just a month before the tournament, she met with Billy Talbert, the U.S. Open tournament director at the time, to lobby him on her equal pay proposition. To boost her argument, King lined up sponsors who agreed to balance out the prize purses. King's stroke of bravery worked. Band deodorant donated $55,000 to even out the prize pool. As a result, both singles champions took home $25,000 that year. But King didn't stop there. Later that year, she took on former world's number one Bobby Riggs in the battle of the sexes. Riggs claimed the women's game wasn't as challenging and that he could beat any of the top women despite being in his 50s. King took up the challenge after Riggs handily beat her longtime rival, Margaret Court. In a televised match watched by millions of tennis fans around the world, King beat Riggs in three sets. Her victory helped solidify the idea that women play the same game and should be paid the same as a result. However, despite all of King's successes fighting for equal pay, it took the other majors decades to catch up. The Australian Open began paying equal prize money in 1984, but stopped in 1995, saying the men's tournament brought in better ratings. Equal pay was reinstated in 2001. The French Open was next, instituting equal pay in 2006. Wimbledon was the final tournament to join the fray, thanks in part to an op-ed from Venus Williams. In it, she urged the tournament to modernize its policy. Now, more than a decade later, other sports are beginning to embrace the idea of equal pay. In 2019, the World Surf League began paying out equal prizes, which league CEO Sophie Goldschmidt said was part of a larger strategy to elevate women's surfing. These women absolutely deserve it. They're surfing on the same waves. They're putting their bodies on the line. I mean, talk about bravery. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible what they're doing. And as role models, we felt they deserve to absolutely be paid the same. The leagues aren't alone. Sponsors also play a big role in the fight for equal pay. In the 70s, band deodorant helped Billie Jean King solidify equal pay at the U.S. Open. Now brands like Adidas and Nike are helping to even the playing field in soccer. In March, Adidas announced that it would pay its players on the winning Women's World Cup team the same bonus it pays male champions. For its part, Nike's been kicking up its support for the U.S. women's national team, releasing Dream With Us, an ad aimed at inspiring young girls to get in the game. However, Nike did come under fire recently for the way it treats pregnant athletes. Olympic gold medalist Allison Felix called out the company in a New York Times op-ed in May, saying the company wanted to pay her 70% less after she decided to have a baby. While sponsors are helping to even the playing field, they alone are not enough. Ultimately, ensuring equality falls on the organizations that oversee professional sports. That's why the U.S. women's national team's lawsuit is so important. It could set a precedent for the way female athletes are paid in other leagues, especially those that don't get the media attention women's soccer does. And it's why former women's national team member Angela Hughes says that the Americans are one of the only teams who have what it takes to make this big of a statement. They understand that they are playing for something much larger than themselves. And to be able to win this World Cup, it just puts them uh, in that much better of a position to potentially argue that point. But you know what, that's, that's another reason to go back to what they've done on the field in that first match. You know, they are out there saying, you know what, it's an expression of all of this that they're carrying. And so to say, we are here, this is who we are, it's empowered statement from this U.S. team. Despite all that's going on for Team USA, starting defender Crystal Dunn says their focus is still on the task at hand, 
defending their title as world champions. For us, we know that is top priority. So, uh, you know, the lawsuit happened, obviously, but ultimately we know it's okay to focus on, you know, social uh, issues that are going on, but ultimately we want to be prepared for this World Cup. So top priority right now is bring home a, a trophy, hopefully, knock on wood, um, but, and then taking care of um, all the things that we're fighting for as well after. The eyes of female athletes around the world are on Team USA. If they come out on top in France, it could tip the scale in their fight for equal pay and change professional sports forever.